This is Andrew Jones, Climate Interactive, and I'm here with Ellie. Hi, everyone. And Bindu. Hi, everyone. We're here in Madrid, and back in Asheville, North Carolina, is Caroline Reed. Hi. All right, this is our team. We got Travis Frank, our CTO, over on the couch. And um, we're just really excited that you're all here to learn about and dig in and use this tool of En-ROADS to make a big difference. And I'll just say that the headline here, and the headline that we're seeing is that we just got back from the negotiations over in uh, the Madrid COP, COP25, and it's just in really clear that those negotiations are not going to get us all the way where we need to get well below two degrees with an effort to get to 1.5. What we need is people reaching out to academics, to youth, to community groups, to business, to government in 195 countries around the world. So we need to do that with powerful tools that are engaging, science-based, and powerful. That's you. So the world needs you. The world needs you using these tools that we have here. Uh, that's what we're going to be digging into. We're going to show you the tool. We're going to play with it together. And we're going to uh, show you how you can be engaged in this important work. <clears throat> uh, we're a partnership with MIT Sloan's Sustainability Initiative. And we're Climate Interactive, a US NGO. And uh, we're funded by this amazing group of organizations out there in the world. CERDNA, Rockefeller Brothers Fund, Hewlett, Why Wait Fund, Morgan, HSBC, the KR Foundation, Mohammed. UM6P, KR, BKRF, and the Goldman Sonnenfeld Foundation via MIT. These folks have invested over the last 10 years in this En-ROADS tool and this capacity to get it out into the world. You probably know us, and many of us out there know us for our work with C-ROADS, the simulator that's been used in the climate scoreboard, adding up all the pledges to the Copenhagen Agreement and to the Paris Agreement also working directly with decision makers and embedded in the game world climate that's been played by over 60,000 people around the world. We're also the creators of this idea of multi-solving, recognizing that taking action on climate doesn't just help the climate, it has near-term co-benefits in food and water, jobs and assets, health, connection, energy industry, and resilience. And if we wanna get those co-benefits, we need to really plan for them and design for them to make sure that the most vulnerable people in the world aren't hurt by our implementation of climate solutions. Here's the challenge that we all face. You all know that if we're not headed on this red path, this orange path you see in the middle, but uh, perhaps towards the blue path, towards 3.3 degrees C or so, what we need to be doing is getting those green lines, uh, get on track to reduce emissions significantly in the near term. Our vision of how to do it, really, uh, it's challenged, all of us are challenged by this idea that research shows that showing people research doesn't work. Research shows that showing people research doesn't work, said John Sturman, our advisor and partner at MIT Sloan. Instead, what we all need to do and what you're going to be able to do with this tool of En-ROADS is to engage people interactively to think on their own terms and make conclusions based on the best available science with their peers with a grounded tool. That's what we'll be doing with En-ROADS. So we're gonna play with it in a minute, but I know you're at a computer, open another tab right now. Go to enroads.org and open up the model. I'll be playing with it, you'll be suggesting some things, but play with it yourself and then go to the corner and share your scenario to Twitter. More of you are doing it than we ever imagined. So go play with the model right now. Enroads.org hit play, hit just to open the simulator in the corner and start playing with it while we also dig in and uh, try the simulator itself. And here it is. Um, this is the, the interface itself. And what we're going to do is think about what we can do to get this temperature down well below two degrees by testing the 18 things sliders at the bottom with many more that are buried underneath in a world where coal oil gas are all growing renewables are growing but not fast enough bioenergy is growing here's the nuclear here's a new tech like thorium fission or nuclear fusion 
creating the greenhouse gas emissions over on the right, creating a world that we don't want to see a 4.1. So right now, we're going to do a mini version of the En-ROADS Climate Workshop. By the way, the whole description of that workshop is on our website. Go there and check it out as well. But here's a mini version. So I'm going to ask you, what should we test? What would you like to experiment with of all the sliders down here at the bottom? What is one action that would be interesting to see? What is its impact on long-term temperature? Go to the questions box in the GoToWebinar app and type what you'd really like to see. So um, think of something, you can see all the different levers that are down here, coal, oil, gas, carbon price, electrification, methane, agriculture, food, carbon removal, deforestation, energy efficiency. What, what do you like? I see several people chiming in uh, saying they'd like to explore carbon price or carbon tax. Carbon price or carbon tax. Okay, down here, you can see two ways to do it. One of them is just to click anywhere, like not status quo, but oh, and actually before I hit it, think, 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 think. If we had a carbon tax, what would happen? Which line in the top left would move the most? Which do you think would move the most of, of coal, oil, gas, renewables, bio, nuclear? Think about it and then imagine where temperature is going to go if I put in a very high carbon tax. So I'm going to run it again. I'm going to replay that last change. Watch which one moved? The brown line, coal. Coal is the most carbon dense fuel. Therefore, and it's the, on the most economic edge of viability in many places around the world. So if we have a very high carbon price, we're gonna see it drop and drop soon. Look at peaks in 2021 and falls. What's going up? We also see wind and solar, less coal, more wind and solar. That's the green line goes up. Does the red line move very much? Not really. We only increase the carbon price to, well, only $112 a ton all around the world. Mind you, this is a global model. That's about a dollar on a gallon of gas in the United States, which increases its price maybe a third so uh, it doesn't yet lead people to use their uh, oil more efficiently or less. So there's the first test. And what did it do overall? It, that black area of energy CO2 shrunk a lot and temperature went from 4.1 to 3.4. Did it save the world? No. Did it help a lot? Yes. It's not sufficient. It's not a silver bullet, but certainly it makes a huge contribution. So what's the second thing? If we have a carbon, big carbon price like that, it helps a lot. What else do we need? Um, I saw electrification on transport. Electrification of transport. Let's see how it does. If we've decarbonized a lot, wow, that helps a lot as well. 0.2 degrees. That is a lot in the world of getting down to well below two. Uh, I'll, I'll run it again. Why does it help? Look at how that oil it keeps in the ground. The red line of oil goes down. We get more wind and solar, a little bit more coal because that's one way to get more electricity. But uh, that's another thing that helps. Um, maybe a third that isn't about energy, ideally. Did anyone suggest anything about energy? not energy? Um, I saw someone mention agricultural practices like no-till agriculture. No-till agriculture, absolutely. This is in the area of carbon removal. So if we look underneath carbon removal and we say we're gonna use detailed settings um, and scroll down, if we don't till the soil as much, more carbon is kept underground in the soil and some people in the Royal Society estimated it could be up to about five gigatons a year uh, after it grows and it takes a while to grow look over on the right you can see it growing up to five gigatons of removal a year and i'm going to run it again you'll notice oh hold on a second um i'm going to make that change again we'll go underneath here use detailed settings uh and we'll increase it up look at the graph in the middle see this silver area that's the removal it's below zero because it's being removed from the atmosphere everything above is being added so if we have that along with the two other things that you mentioned you had a carbon price you also had electrification that gets us to 3.1 i think you can see where this is going 
Our vision of these workshops, and we've been running them, I ran them a couple of weeks ago for 47 members of the US Congress. Uh, we've been doing sessions really all around the world as we test this tool. What happens now is that people make more suggestions, they talk to each other, they learn about different solutions, and what we do is we construct a scenario together that meets the goal of the Paris Agreement. As you can imagine, what does it take? It takes more renewables, it takes energy efficiency, and I'm just gonna make a scenario, there are infinite ways to get here, but this one, this combination of afforestation, deforest, less deforestation, maybe some more electrification, there's a scenario that gets us to two degrees. And this is really the third main insight that you hit with En-ROADS. The first, there's no silver bullet. Even a high carbon price is not a silver bullet. Instead, it's what we might call silver buckshot. Many actions across these sectors coming together to deliver upon two degrees. And the third, is it still possible? This suite of actions together can create in a grounded model, a two degree future. And of course we could push it and play with other levers and get down to 1.5 as well. So that's just a quick intro to the tool itself. And I'm gonna pass it over to Ellie to talk a little bit about how we use this, how this is actually helpful in the world. Yeah, and before we go over Drew, if you just go back to uh, the, um, the in roads for a second and i just i saw one question here that I, I can i'll address real quickly on how do you access the graphs um, and change the graphs so there are three ways you can access the graphs one you, you can go uh click on the title to the graph so drew if you would click on greenhouse gas net emissions by gas then this graph that we're looking at here is currently under greenhouse gas emissions but this is a whole folder of the dozens and dozens of different graphs we have. The second way you can change the graph is by going to the graphs menu uh, over there on the, uh, there's Drew and dropping down and you can see the same uh, range of different graph selection there. Um, and the third way you can change the graphs is by going to the miniature graphs view and, you, and here's a selection of 12 of our favorite graphs uh, and you can choose from the graphs there. So uh, we'll give you multiple ways and switch to switch around the graphs um, also, a couple other things to note on the uh, interface before we leave Sorry. it um, is uh, that you can access additional, additional information about each graph by clicking the triangle on the graph to the left of it there. Um, and then uh, on, for each of the sliders, you can click on the um, three dots and then click on the triangle beside it to read additional information. There's further information for you to read. Uh, if you click on the I button there in the advanced view, um, and you can read this selection from the user guide, or you can pop that out into a new tab and read it actually on the user guide itself. So we have lots of additional documentation to help you become grounded in uh, the different uh, controls you have within En-ROADS. Um, but Drew, yeah, if you pull up this slide here. So how do we imagine people using En-ROADS? Well, um, there's several different ways. One, I mean, you can just sit at your computer and use it by yourself, but we really believe that change comes through people interacting with each other and uh, with sharing tools, having conversations, talking about potential solutions. And so we've provided several different formats in which people, we have provided resources on our website in which people can, can get up to speed. And, uh, and using En-ROADS in group settings. The first is the En-ROADS Climate Workshop. Then we have a, a role-playing game called the Climate Action Simulation. Then a student exercise that's a homework assignment that if you're an educator, you might use in a classroom setting. Uh, in addition to that, we have worked with different media outlets on interactives. And really, you know, here we are, we've just launched this tool. We don't know what comes next. And we're looking to you all to explore all the different kinds of creative ideas for uh, how we might use En-ROADS. So the first, the En-ROADS Climate Workshop, this is uh, set up as a, a for groups, uh, maybe groups who are already thinking about climate change, and it starts with kind of asking people, well, what are you doing on climate change? Um, and what if what you were doing on, on climate change was expanded to the whole world, and those actions were spread worldwide? And then you can extrapolate out and, and move uh, uh, one of the sliders to see the impact that that makes. And then from there, the group continues to interactively build a scenario uh, that reaches the Paris Agreement goals of limiting warming to well below two degrees and aiming for 1.5. We 
we've already started to pilot these workshops with a number of different settings. Uh, Drew is flipping through different slides here, but elected officials we've met with um, and run the workshop for in the United States, as well as um, corporate partners uh, such as HSBC, where they've started to explore the ways in which they can integrate inroads into their corporate trainings. Uh, but there's a tons of different opportunities here for this workshop to be used within civil society groups uh, and many others uh, across the spectrum of different audiences. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Bindu, who's gonna talk a little bit about the climate action simulation role-playing game. Thanks, Eli. Uh, so just like Eli said, we have adopted En-ROADS into a role play game, which we call as climate action simulation. So what we do in this uh, game is we divide the participants into major stakeholder group who have major say in climate decisions. So as you can see uh, in the screen, we, we have given here some examples of how participants can be divided, say conventional energy, clean tech, land and cultural and forestry industry, and what they do is they propose actions and in real time we can actually test with the help of enders how their policy decisions impact future climate scenarios and this game the climate action simulation which is adopted with enders is actually complemented with our very widely used uh, simulation old climate simulation that uses CROs, which was another tool, and it has been used by over 600 climate leaders in 92 countries around the world. And we are here in uh, Madrid, uh, in COP, and just a few days back, uh, me and one of my colleagues uh, ran all climate simulation as well as climate action simulation with young colleagues here. And it was very interesting to see their reaction after being in this game. Some said that they were frustrated, while others say that they are hopeful and ready to take action. This is what we are trying to do with this game, really engage people uh, in meaningful conversation and foster climate action more robustly. And we have done a study uh, who says that 83% of people who actually participated in this kind of interactive works up led by us are likely to take action after their participation. All right, so thank you, Bindu and Ellie. Then those really are the forms that we wanna, those are really the forms that we wanna emphasize for using the model. And um, as you're probably playing with the model and maybe go into the website, really the, what the follow-up of this is going to be is to join the trainings and you can look at the training plan on the website. So uh, you can either focus now on some of the science of what's behind the model or go on the website and go look at the training plan to see what it takes to join the webinars that we're signing up in January so that you can get trained in how to be one of the facilitators of the workshop or the game. I do wanna take a little time to talk about uh, how this model is different, how we build confidence in it. Um, as you can imagine, uh, there's a lot that goes into building confidence in, in a model such as this. And one thing that separates it from many other models is that every time you move a slider, actually the, all the 15,000 equations in the model are simulating every time you move the slider. This is different from some other uh, things that are on the web that look pretty similar, but are actually databases. There's one that's done by YASA, the 1.5 degree scenario of Explorer. There's also a tool that a WRI puts out that allows you to access different simulation scenarios. It's also different in another way in that it's a simple model relative to the suite of integrated assessment models. You may have heard of the IPCC reports. that will say, oh, models say this or say that, or. Uh, a little over a year ago, there was the uh, 1.5 degree report, a special report that um, included models runs on 1.5 degrees from integrated assessment models. I just wanna point out how we're different but complementary to those. Uh, those are much greater in scope and detail, but they're not as fast and they're not set up for use by decision makers. Our models have less scope and detail, those models will have say 30 economic regions, over 200 physical regions. We have one of each, much simpler, but easier to use. So because we're much simpler, then we have to do a lot of testing to make sure we got it right. So when you move that carbon price, things change as they ought to change. 
three types of tests. One of them is extreme conditions tests. We take the model, we beat on it, boom, 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 make sure the model is robust and it doesn't break. Second, assumption sensitivity. If you change assumptions, say for the climate sensitivity to a doubling of carbon or the progress ratio, if you change those assumptions in the model, do the conclusions change? If they did, that would be a problem. So we wanna make sure that's not the case. And so we did extensive testing to make sure that wasn't the case. And the third I'm gonna give you more detail on, which is behavior production, reproduction. Are we consistent with the suite of integrated assessment models, such as AIM, GCAM, which image, message, remind? Here's how we do it. And this is just one example with coal. Look in the top corner there. This is the history from the IEA and BP from 1990 to 2015 of what actually happened for electricity generated by coal. So that's what actually happened. Then look in the bottom left is the baseline future for coal. This is where the IEA, Shell, Yasa, uh, another Shell scenario, PBL, this is where people think things are headed with coal under a baseline future. You can see there's a wide range of futures that, are, that they think are possible. Then the third one is a test. They took a carbon price, really high carbon price, and said, what would happen to coal? Coal would be more expensive, coal would go down, and they disagreed somewhat about how fast and how much. You can see the range there. So that's the best available literature in the future. We take En-ROADS and we do the same test, or we check the behavior over the same period of time. And that's what I'll put on here. Watch the blue line. The blue line tracking history pretty well, not exact. The blue line tracking the baseline kind of in the middle of those other scenarios for the baseline. And then here for the carbon price test. That's one test on coal that leads us to be a little more confident in the model. Then we do it again. But with now we have to do it for lots of other variables, not just coal, but GDP, energy intensity, carbon intensity, LULUCF, methane, N2O, uh, coal, oil, gas, biofuels, temperature, all these different variables for the baseline. That's one scenario, but we shouldn't just look at the baseline scenario. We looked at four other scenarios. The scenario called SSP2 6.0, that's watts per meter squared. That's a somewhat lower radiative force in a lower temperature, 4.5, which is a little lower, 2.6, which is even lower, and 1.9. So we test our model against all of those others. Okay, that was a big nerd out on uh, sensitivity testing and other kinds of tests, but we think it's important for you to see what goes underneath uh, the model that you see and that you're playing with right now. We also have to do some tests of CMIP5. Um, that's, this is another result out here uh, of the carbon cycle and the climate sector. So enough science, let's get back to how you as a leader in the world who want to see emissions go down, can use this tool to improve your own thinking, to engage other people, to lead towards effective action on climate. So I'm going to send it back over to Ellie to uh, talk about what happens next. Yeah, so um, what we are aiming to do here today um, and what we're building towards and really launching this week is uh, extending the network of people who are already using our tools with groups, get them up to speed and using En-ROADS and build that network to be so much bigger than it already is. Um, we're starting that with um, holding a training series that's kicking off in January. Uh, you can sign up for that by going to our website and going to the webinars page and finding the sign up link to the Mastering En-ROADS uh, webinar series. Uh, we'll also send a link to that out and I'll give it, put it into the chat later. Um, and with that, we want people to be out there facilitating high impact events with inroads. Um, go back to the slide we were looking at there, Drew. Thank you. Um, and with that, people facilitating these high impact events. Um, we want people to become what we're calling inroads climate ambassadors and to become an inroads climate ambassador we see this as going through our training series practicing running events um, becoming well versed in the materials uh, and getting out there and actually running uh, events and with that you can become an inroads climate ambassador and we're building a network globally uh, our aim is you know what if we had one inroads ambassador for every million people worldwide that would be 7,700 
inroads climate ambassadors leading events worldwide uh, with our world climate simulation we already have hundreds and hundreds of facilitators maybe some of you here on this webinar today uh, have facilitated our other uh, simulation the world climate simulation so the big question is will you join us uh, you're already here on this webinar check you got interested uh, the second step is to join our uh, training series in January, uh, then read the guides and explore the materials. They're on our website. There's lots of lots and lots of things there. Practice running events, uh, run it with your friends, your family, uh, in small groups or large groups, uh, and then share it with others. So Drew's going over to our uh, website here where you can go to Inroads Climate Workshop and learn more about that. Check out the Inroads training plan, and uh, then sign up for those training webinars on the uh, webinars page there. So this is where you should go. You just saw the path. This is the, of course, the launch event that you're part of right now. And by the way, there's one more of these in a week from right now. If there are people that you know of who also might be interested, who would like to be an Inroads Climate Ambassador or just play with the tool. Uh, send them to this last event on the 12th, uh, the launch event. But the big one to really focus on is mastering En-ROADS, how to understand the simulator and facilitate the En-ROADS game or workshop. It's going to be starting in January, and that's going to be a really interesting dive into how to present the model, how to engage people, and how to set up an event where you get people to come together to think about addressing climate change, enroll them in taking effective action using En-ROADS as a catalyst to deeper thinking and greater commitment to action. It's going to be a seven-part webinar, should be very interesting and engaging, connect you with people around the world who are doing this important work of addressing climate change. So go to this spot on the, on the website, and then you're going to hit the register button and it'll show you where you can go here, the times, the description, you just sign in and off you go to uh, uh, signing up. Um, the other parts of the actions that we really think are um, exciting and important is you were just playing with the model a minute ago. I hope you opened up a tab and you made, say, this two degree scenario. So what you could do right now is go to the corner here and hit share your scenario and you click share on twitter share on facebook share on linkedin or copy this scenario and you can email it to a friend but if i hit the share it on twitter for the 18th time today <laughs> i've been doing this too much uh i it's so fun though like you go here there it is here's a climate scenario built with the enron simulator you hit tweet and off it goes and it will show up here look over on the right We've already been, oh, Eliza, you already did it. Thank you. And that must, I bet that was you, uh, Eliza Wilkinson. So there's the tweet I just said. Here's a climate scenario built with the En-ROAD simulator. Here's one from Eliza. I'm going to see, I'm calling you out here, Eliza. What did you do? You made a scenario 1.1. .1. Oh, make it so, Eliza Wilkinson. Holy smokes. This would be the dream scenario. Limiting warming, it does peak. Let's see, this is interesting. You taxed coal, oil, gas, tax bioenergy, very high carbon price, a breakthrough in new technology, pushed everything to the limit, didn't touch population economic growth. It grows, it peaks here in 2040 at 1.6 degrees, and then is coming back down lower. Let's look at some other things. How did we do? I'm gonna look at some other factors. Eliza, interesting to see. Look at all those carbon removal that you did. That's a lot of carbon removal. Let's also look and see what kind of um, emissions. So there's emissions growing, dropping to negative emissions. I'm also curious to see your net zero. So net zero by 2050, Eliza. Okay, I get carried away looking at, uh, curious to see what she came up with. But this is the idea, make a scenario, go to the corner, hit share your scenario, and then we get to go on your tweet deck over here and go see your scenario. Here's Seth Sheldon's, well, he was a little bit more modest. He came up with 1.6, you get the idea. So make a scenario, go to the website, join us in January to become a En-ROADS climate ambassador. Um, is it time for other questions and comments? What are you reading? 
Bindu, did you, in the questions, did you see any questions there that were particularly interesting? Yes. Uh, so one question is the difference between C roots and N roots. And the next is, uh, are there any costs involved with being an ambassador? Ah, the second one is really easy. Are there any costs? Um, no, no money. It is free, 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 all the way free. All we ask, though, is that you're enrolled in this mission, our shared mission, which we know you are. So uh, we're also, I guess, the other thing, we're always fascinated for you to share back with us whatever you're coming up with. Register your workshop. Write about it, tweet about it, write a blog post about it, take some pictures and post it to Instagram or email it to us. So it's there is a bi-directional flow of value, we'll say. We're giving you this. Please give back to the mission, your experience and your learning and send your ideas in. But the first question is about the difference between C roads and N roads. And I'm pulling up uh, C roads. Here's the C road simulator, which is also on our website. Also has a fantastic game. It's been played by 60,000 people around the world. And the difference here is that this model is broken up by country. What you see in the bottom left is you can see what would happen if China peaked its emissions in 2025. This is changes pledges by countries, six different regions. As you just saw, En-ROADS is one region of the world, but it is broken up at least into these 18 levers, but many underneath. So that's the big difference. One of them is focused on countries. One of them is focused on actions, policies, and solutions. Other questions that have come up, and if either of you want to take the answer, please Turn on your camera and just go for it. Oh, I've been uh, writing in uh, answers to questions to people's questions just into the the box, so people may see those as well. Okay. Um, Bindu, I, or, yeah. I do ahead. see one some question a theme of questions just around. Um, can you say something about the the financial side of the model, like how are costs factored in or feedbacks? Uh, are there any feedbacks to GDP, things like that? Great. So there three things to think about costs. One of them is that along the way, as we think about how much investment there is in oil production, coal production, and gas production, investment in renewables, those are all driven by costs and prices. How much does it cost to get a barrel of oil out of the ground? What does it cost to convert coal into electricity? So the prices all along the way internal to the model. Secondly, when you do take actions such as have a carbon price. That's going to create financial outcomes such as revenues, such as costs. And those, if you go here under financial, it's going to show you revenue and costs. So here's one graph, for example, where we see the revenue from taxes. There was a carbon price, a very high carbon price that created, what is that, $11 trillion in revenue here. But also some subsidies. You would get a subsidy to nuclear and renewables. On net, it was high, and then the net is the revenue minus cost went down. So there's a lot to dig into regarding those outputs. But your third question was about feedback. Some integrated assessment models will say, well, if you spend a lot of money on a carbon price, that's gonna change what happens in your economy. It may change GDP per capita, how fast your economy is growing. That feedback is not included in this model. You have the chance to change GDP per capita. In fact, Seth did. Here was the scenario that he created. See GDP, here's gross world product, and I'll show it up here in this graph, and decided that it was going to be higher. It could also uh, be smaller in different ways, so you can change it in some ways. So there are many ways to change it, but the feedback is not included from carbon price, nor is it included from temperature. We do think there will be economic impacts if temperature gets all the way to 1.7 degrees C above pre-industrial, but we did not model the effect of temperature back to the economy yet. We're working on it. We may find a way to do it. It's, it's pretty challenging, so we haven't added it to this version. Other questions that are important? Yes, there is a question about if we can populate the data with regional, with regional understanding rather than the global one. Is it possible to populate this with regional versus global? The short answer is no. 
The longer answer is maybe someday we will. There are other excellent models out there. Energy Innovation has an online model, Energy Innovation, go check it out. I think they have seven countries and regions of the world. Go look at those. Also the Deep Decarbonization Project has a whole suite of models, I think for every country in the world. So go look at those models, but not for ours yet. Other good questions that you see? I'm kind of tempted to go back and see other people's scenarios. Look at you typing these things in so fast. <laughs> Son Seth. Uh, all right, others? Um, I know there was uh, some suggestions early on asking about new technology and uh, what that means and how that works. Great, do one of you wanna take that or do you want me to um, talk through the new tech? Sure, I can take it. Um, so if we're looking here, we have this slider. So Drew's reset the simulator. And if we adjust new technology, so this is some kind of zero carbon technology that we don't yet have. And say we uh, move that up to where there is a breakthrough. So that means that uh, this year, out of some uh, technological laboratory, some new technology uh, comes out that provides a new source of energy supply and then starts to rapidly scale up. So before we do that, um, think about what what impact uh, do you think new technology, some new technology might have? Do you think it would lower temperature by half a degree, by one degree? Would it take us all the way down to two degrees alone? Is that the is that the silver bullet that we've all been looking for? Um, Think about that. Okay, so now Drew, adjust a new technology up to where there's a breakthrough. All right, and you see there, it brings temperature down some, and then over on the left graph there, you can see that that orange line of new technology, which was at the bottom, is now rising significantly. And push it all the way. Like, let's see what happens if we do a huge breakthrough. There you can see, and then Drew's replaying the change so you can watch the impact that that then makes. See what goes down, uh, coal, oil, uh, gas. This new technology would be the cheapest technology out there. And uh, if you go into the advanced settings, uh, you, can, you can look at what our assumptions are for what this uh, technology might mean. So you can see if there was a new technology in 2020, it takes a while and these delays are built into inroads uh, for the new technology to scale up and really start taking on a more significant market share. Um, and you can uh, you can adjust those settings to whatever you prefer. So great question. Yeah, and really overall, you can see on the right with the temperature, it really did not bring about the huge breakthrough that most people think it would, excuse me, the, the big results on temperature that most people think. There's another interesting thing that it does. Notice what happens when we brought that breakthrough cost of energy the way it spread around the world is it was super inexpensive. What happens if we have super inexpensive energy? Well, people will use more of it. There's a little rebound effect. So that's another thing that leads it to be not as big an impact as you would have thought. Other questions or comments? Yes, there are a few questions about assumptions that are in the model. What kind of assumptions then? That are, that are not in the model. Sorry, that are in the model. We do yeah. Can define so yeah, yeah. So um so questions about assumptions in the model. If people so two ways to look at that. One of them is here, things that you can explore and change. So there are some assumptions that are particularly important. We made accessible. The biggest one that people talk about in the climate science world is the climate sensitivity to a doubling of carbon. It's set at three and it's documented here. Here's the explanation of where we got that number, but it could be lower. And in that case, if there were, if it was lower, then boy, that new tech would bring us all the way down to 3.1 degree. If it was higher, it'd be much higher up at 4.5 degrees. But if you're interested in the assumptions behind the model, the best place to go would be to go here to the Climate Interactive website, go to tools and go down to the En-ROADS page, and in the area of the science and behind the simulator, it explains all assumptions, equations, and parameters are documented 
in the En-ROADS reference guide, which is 380 pages of fascinating reading that we can download here, go open it up, and read about all of the fascinating assumptions here in the simulator um, reference guide. So every equation in the model is shared here, so you could go and look and see the structure and everything in the model. That's the best way to check it out. Also, you can send an email to us at support at enroad, excuse me, at um, climbinginteractive.org, and we can answer any of your technical questions about the model. Other questions and comments? And by the way, if along the way, if you have the model, play with it, click on the share your scenario and share on Twitter. We're curious to see the scenarios that you want to make. So here is an interesting question. Uh, has anyone run the model many, many times with varying assumptions to determine this cost scenario? Uh, has anybody run the the model like in a Monte Carlo run to determine the least cost scenarios and the least cost approaches? Um, I'm I know that we have not done an exhaustive study like that, and a lot of models are used that way. It could be used that way, not with this interface, but with the full version of the model in Benson. My my sense is that. My friend and colleague, Travis Frank's ears perked up on this one. And I'm gonna just ask over there, Travis, do you know anyone who's done that with En-ROADS yet in Bensim? So I know we've done a full Monte Carlo with uh, uh, RM sensitivity. We've done... I don't think he, yeah. So I think we probably can't, we know we, you, no, we can't hear not. the voice. So uh, I think the short answer is for this, the policies, no. Someone could, really, as you can see, we're taking a different approach here. We think that the learning that happens by creating these scenarios on your own is the best way to go about it for learning, particularly with decision makers. Uh, we had to do a lot of Monte Carlo testing when we did the extreme conditions test that I told you about earlier and the assumption sensitivity test. But thank you for that good question. Others? Um, I see a question here about is there a way to run inroads offline? So uh, Inroads doesn't act, doesn't isn't entirely a desktop app, but one trick uh, if you want to use it offline is just load it in your browser tab, and then when you go offline, your Wi-Fi disconnects or whatever. Inroads will still work, uh, even if as long as it stays open in a browser tab, it will still run. It doesn't need to call up the internet to operate. So uh, that's one trick you can use for running Inroads offline. Any other last questions? Yes, uh, so there is a question about if degree Celsius can be converted into degree Fahrenheit, the temperature graph. I, I missed it, say it again. Fahrenheit. Ah, Fahrenheit. Great question. So <laughs> right here you see it says 4.1 degrees C, 7.3 in Fahrenheit, it's small. When we ran this for US Congress, we switch this over under view you go under view to us units and it flips so there it's in fahrenheit for people who love using the non-metric system all right a good final set uh, simple question i'm going to leave you with your call to action so your call to action make a scenario in here share it on twitter or facebook or somewhere else go to the website climate interactive Go under En-ROADS work, Climate Workshop, go to the training plan, look at the training plan, and where it says webinars, sign up and register for a webinar. And third, send a friend to the webinar that's going to be a week from right now to join and um, use, to learn how to use this model themselves. But it's good. We thought we were going to be an hour. We're done early. Let's finish. Go out there and make a difference in addressing climate change, engage somebody to think with a rigorous tool that you now have on your desktop with En-ROADS. Overall, we need emissions to go down. It's not gonna be easy, but it's gonna be worth it. Go get them, everybody.